Welcome everyone to the Society of Critical Care Medicine ICU Liberation webcast, Nurse Driven Protocol for the Management of Alcohol and Polysubstance Abuse, the AACN Clinical Scene Investigator Academy Project. My name is Diane Byram. My name is Diane Byram, and I am the Manager of Quality Implementation Programs at the Society of Critical Care Medicine. I have no relative disclosures, and I will be moderating today's webcast. This webcast is held in collaboration with AACN CSI Academy. With that, I'd like to introduce Devin Bowers, CSI Program Manager, who is going to tell us about the AACN CSI Program. Devin. Good morning. I'm Devin Bowers, Program Manager for the American Association of Critical Care Nurses Clinical Scene Investigator Academy, also known as CSI. It is my pleasure to introduce you to this program. CSI is a 16-month academy designed to build leadership and innovation skills in frontline staff nurses. AACN believes that frontline nurses are key members to engage in the transformation of healthcare. The CSI Academy combines education and ex experiential learning to enable nurses to design, implement, and measure outcomes of a change project that improves patient care or positively impacts their unit and or hospital. To date, we've completed the program in six regional cohorts and currently have two active cohorts. Our speakers today are part of our third cohort located in the Boston area. And now I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Devin. The webcast today will include approximately 40 minutes of content. Due to the short nature of this educational activity, there will be no CECME offered. You are invited to ask questions for of our presenters throughout the webcast. You may do so by typing your question into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel. Questions will be addressed after the presentation. The webcast will be available at www iculiberation.org on SCCM's YouTube channel the next business day. We invite you to share this and the many other ICU webcast and patient stories with your colleagues widely. Please remember to post on Facebook and also to tweet at hashtag ICULib to any, at any time during this webcast to spread the word. This Webcast will also be placed onto the Project Dispatch website at www.secm.org um, slash Project Dispatch. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, it's my pleasure to do that. We have Lori Wilson, RN, MSN, and we have Christina Icasa Guterres. Um, both are staff nurses um, at, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, and we would like to welcome them to start the presentation. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lori Wilson, and I'm going to uh, start off uh, the webinar today uh, with our poll questions. Um, listed on the screen is what percentage of your patients are admitted with alcohol or polysubstance abuse? Please select one, less than 5%, less than 20%, between 25 and 50%, and more than 50%. Okay, our quick poll shows that um, the hospitals and the people that were checking in are between 25 and 50%. Our next poll question is, does your institution have a protocol to manage alcohol and polysubstance abuse patients? Please select one, yes, no, or unsure. So 
So uh, the people polling in have said yes, that uh, they do have a protocol to manage alcohol and polysubstance abuse patients at 68%. So today we're here to do a webinar on uh, our protocol uh, that we created with the CSI Academy. It's nurse-driven protocol for the management of patients in alcohol and substance withdrawal. Our MICU is a 20-bedded unit where the patient population has been largely geriatric. Over the last two years, the population has changed dramatically to include multiple alcoholic and polysubstance abuse patients in withdrawal. As Devin Powers mentioned earlier, we were approached by our nurse manager with an opportunity to apply for CSI. Christina and myself, along with two night shift nurses from our unit, Sharon Hawthorne and Ari Williams, decided that if we were to apply for this opportunity to effect change, we wanted it to impact positively our patient population as well as our nurses. With the large influx of withdrawal patients that were moving through the ICU, the nurses were noticing that these patients were highly resource intensive and clinically challenging for the nursing staff. Most of these patients were being admitted with multiple comorbidities. Some had pneumonia, GI bleeds, and because the physicians were not always able to take a thorough history, these patients began withdrawing 72 hours into their ICU stay. These patients were agitated, combative, at high risk for falls, climbing over side rails, and took most of the RN's time throughout the shift to keep the patients safe. If the staff would approach one intensivist, the medications were very sedating and sometimes impeded the patient from timely extubation. If the staff approached another intensivist, the medication doses were quite smaller and frequent, so the RN was right back where they had started, struggling with their patients. Ultimately, the staff needed clear guidelines to clinically manage these patients, and so our team created the nurse-driven protocol for the management of alcohol and polysubstance abuse. Once our project was accepted, we knew that most of our withdrawal patients came from the ED, and that a lot of the time they were intubated due to over-sedation, regrettably resulting in a younger population with tracheostomies. We knew that we needed a more objective way to measure a patient's degree of agitation and that we needed an algorithm for management that would reduce our varied approach to medicating these patients. Our plan was to develop and implement a nurse-driven, evidence-based protocol for managing alcohol and substance abuse withdrawal patients by utilizing pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. We initially developed goals to begin implementation. Our team decided to utilize the RAS scale, or the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, to recognize earlier the symptoms of withdrawal that we needed to manage. We hoped to reduce the severity of withdrawal symptoms, decrease ventilator days, decrease complications such as falls, injuries, ventilator-associated pneumonias, and ultimately decrease MICU length of stay. Next, we created an action plan that included a pre- and post-survey tool to ascertain how the staff felt about caring for patients in withdrawal. We developed and implemented an algorithm of medications along with nursing measures, launched project and provided on staff, uh, ongoing staff re-education, developed an audit tool to track identified patients, and recruited champions from the day and the night shift. Our team started in January with a literature review to see if any other studies were available that had addressed the medication algorithm for withdrawing patients. Next, we distributed to the day and night shift a pre-project survey. The survey basically attempted to ascertain how comfortable the RN was for caring, was caring for a withdrawing patient and if they understood and could use the RAS scale. We chose the RAS scale over the CWA scale since many of our patients are nonverbal. We created an algorithm that the nurses could follow along with a catchy slogan, Stop DTs, Fast DC. We kicked off the project with an education session in which we offered the day and night shift breakfast. We, gave, we had giveaways such as totes, water bottles, pen lights, and ID badge holders with our slogan on it. We created an audit tool to monitor patients on the RAS protocol and began collecting data while implementing the program. 
Here you will see the RAS scale. Now the nurses had a way of addressing the level of agitation to a physician, and this was charted hourly so that medications could be adjusted appropriately. Our team drove home the slogan, Stop DTs, Fast DC. Patients were identified outside the room with a blue flyer that said RAS making the healthcare staff from housekeeping to the physicians aware that this patient may be agitated and at a higher risk for falls. This next slide shows the algorithm that we created. At the top, the RAS score on agitated and withdrawing patients should be done every hour and PRN as needed. Patients with a RAS score of plus two to plus four should initiate the algorithm. Signs and symptoms of withdrawal include agitation, tachycardia, confusion, hallucinations, restlessness, diaphoresis, headache, anxiety, hand tremors, and insomnia. Then we would ascertain if the patient was having any pain. Pain can sometimes be confused with agitation. If the patient has pain, then we could utilize three commonly used pain medications, morphine, hydromorphone, and fentanyl. If the patient was still experiencing agitation, many nursing measures could be addressed, including constant watch, reorientation, decreased stimulation, always addressing nutrition and hydration, replacing electrolytes, toileting, which we found to be very important, timely removal of catheters, early mobilization, sleep promotion, environment management, emotional support, encouraging family involvement, and getting social work referrals. Medications could then start being introduced with immediate acting ones like lorazepam, IV push, PRN, advancing to dexmedtomidine or Presidex infusions if necessary. Long acting oral medications should be started at this point as necessary, such as chlorodiazepoxide, clonazepam, ketapine, gabapentin, and methadone, always supplementing these patients with folic acid, multivitamin, and thiamine. If at this point the RAS score is greater than a negative three sustained for four hours, we would start titrating medications such as IV Presidex, then long-acting medications by decreasing dose and or decreasing frequency. On these patients also, lab values should be evaluated such as alcohol levels, CBCs, liver profiles, PT, INR, basic metabolic panel, magnesium, phosphorus, toxicology screens such as serum and urine, serum amylase and osmolarity, and EKGs so we could monitor for prolonged QT. Here are some pictures of our project launch. Um, the first is a flyer that invited both the day and the night staff to a breakfast. That way we could encompass both shifts. Some of our giveaways in the bottom left-hand corner. And a picture of our team with our CSI coach, Camille Scarciota, VP of Nursing. Here are some more pictures of our breakfast for the day and night shift and our education session that took place on March 13, 2014. Once you are chosen to participate in the AACN CSI Academy, your hospital receives a grant for $10,000. We used less than $400 for food and festivities and a little over $1,600 for the giveaways, leaving us over $7,900 in the grant to continue support of our nurse-driven protocol. From April 2014, we continued to re-educate the staff and continuously engage the physicians as well as the nurses for full compliance. We tracked patients receiving the RAS protocol and their progress. We even kept notes about each patient and what medications or interventions worked best for them. We recruited champions from the day and night shift to collect data when the four of us were not available. Our team developed educational booklets for the staff as well as the family members and we continued collecting and analyzing data. To increase compliance and take every opportunity to educate, we sponsored a blue and white day on April 30th, 2014, and asked all staff to wear the colors of our slogan to promote awareness. Again, here are some pictures of our nursing staff with our physician support for our initiative. This shows our order set, which we created for the physicians. 
We hoped for better compliance if the doctors could just click on what they wanted to order for our withdrawing patients. As you can see in this slide, doses and frequency are still managed by the physician, but leads to an orderly progression of what can and should be ordered for the withdrawing patient. On October 22, 2014, the CSI team was asked to present our project hospital-wide at Nursing Grand Rounds. We were not only supported by the MIC staff, but by many disciplines, including upper management. We took this opportunity to give the staff a project update and a big thank you with a luncheon on the same day, always using the opportunity to re-educate the staff. Of course, with every project comes some challenges, one being the conflict of schedules among team members, since two were on the day shift and two were on nights. It made it very difficult to find time to meet and exchange ideas. Patients not being properly diagnosed on admission by the fellows because they could not be interviewed well, so patients could start withdrawing days into their admission. We had trouble obtaining pertinent data for our project because we were unsure of how to analyze our findings. We needed to encourage especially night shift fellows to utilize the protocol and continue to motivate the RNs to infer, enforce our nurse-driven protocol. Lastly, after implementing the algorithm, our pharmacy restricted use of the higher priced medications due to budgetary constraints. And now I'll turn things over to Christina Icaza Gutierrez. Just going to interject here for a moment. Christina, it looks like your line is muted. OK. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I will be discussing the results of the survey that our team did with the nursing staff pre and post implementation of our project. In comparison with the pre-survey, the post-survey reflected an increased understanding of the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, or the RAS, by 28%. The use of the RAS as an assessment tool increased by 55%, and nursing confidence in managing these patients went up by 37%. When nursing staff are asked on how anxious or overwhelmed are they in assuming care of a patient in withdrawal prior to launch of our protocol, 65% responded being always anxious, whereas after six months of project implementation, only 16% expressed feeling overwhelmed. Nurses felt empowered with autonomy of using the algorithm. There were four falls in MICU between September 2013 to February 2014, which was six months prior to the launch of our project, compared to three falls from March 2014 to August 2014. We consider this a significant improvement since there was much limited ancillary staff in MICU during our project implementation, and we had also stopped utilizing one-to-one -one companions for these patients. Patient outcomes were positively affected with the implementation of the nurse-driven algorithm. There were 71 patients with a diagnosis of alcohol or substance abuse withdrawal six months prior to the launch of our project and there were 54 patients identified during six months of implementation. Average length of stay in MICU went from 6.79 to 5.48 days, which is an average decrease of 1.3 days. Total length of stay in Maimonides for the 71 patients was 1,270 days compared to 701 days for the 54 patients. This reflects an average decrease of five days. There were 48 patients who were on mechanical ventilator out of the 71 patients identified prior to the launch of the project compared to 24 patients out of 54 patients within six months. Average ventilator days went from 7 days to 5.29 days, which is a decrease of 1.73 days. And the total number of patients who had tracheostomy 
went from 11 to 1, which means 15.5% of 71 patients required tracheostomy compared to only 1.9% of the 54 patients included in the project. This table showed the fiscal impact of our protocol implementation. These were the savings calculated based on estimated costs given to us by our finance department. Overall estimated cost savings for six months of project implementation is over $900,000 and therefore a potential annual savings of close to $2 million. We continued to implement our protocol in our unit and we had since gathered data for six months after the completion of our project. We identified 57 patients with alcohol or substance abuse withdrawal from the months of September 2014 to February of 2015. Even though the average length of stay in MICU for these patients remained the same six months prior, the total length of stay in the hospital continued to decline. And there was significant decrease in the total number of ventilator days with the average ventilator days down to only 3.5%. None of the 54 withdrawal patients ended with a tracheostomy. Overall, estimated cost savings for this period amounted to over $1.1 million, which surpassed our savings during the launch of the project. So how did we plan to sustain our project? We have created an order, an order set based on the algorithm with the help of our pharmacy and our MIS department for ease of order entry for our physicians. The increase in our nurse satisfaction encourages staff to continue advocating for the use of the protocol. The CSI, team, the CSI Academy has taught our team to recognize our individual strengths. We learned that the success of the project requires shared ownership of responsibilities and that collaboration promotes improved patient outcomes. We believe that we can affect change in our nursing practice by investing in evidence-based projects. We have enjoyed networking with our colleagues from different hospitals who were with us in the CSI Academy New York cohort and from our co-workers outside nursing, like our MIS department, our team from Performance Improvement Department, who all helped expand our knowledge. Our team agreed that dedicated staff that work together as a team makes all the difference. And so, our team sincerely thank our MICU staff for their continued support, as well as our CNO, our VPs, nurse manager, medical director, attendings, fellows, and our CSI mentors who all helped us in this project. I will now turn over to our moderator for questions. Thank you so much, Christina and Laurie. Um, I just wanted to make a correction. Um, they, um, this group is not from Boston. They are from the Monadies Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, and they were actually part of the AACN CSI cohort number six. And so just wanted to make sure that we um, got a plug in that they, where they were from so that we didn't um, get confused about um, that aspect. So we have some questions. Um, I'm going to start off um, with a question that I had because um, I have done process improvement projects um, throughout my career, and I always am interested in what the people who did the project, what they think was the key to changing their culture. So either one of you can answer this. What do you think the key was to changing your culture to get people to buy in? I think it was very easy to uh, get uh, the staff to buy in because it, it it really took up so many nursing hours to make sure that these withdrawing patients stayed safe. That if there was just some organized algorithm to the way we could give medications when you didn't have an intensivist around, um, that would help a nurse to organize the type of care that she would give these patients, I think it really provided uh, the best buy-in um, for our staff. And of course, when the nurses started seeing that 
the medication regime that we had, along with the nursing measures and along with, you know, checking to see if the patient had pain, when they saw that there was a compliance uh, with the doctors and that it really calmed the patients down, that really was the ultimate buy-in for everyone. Thank you. And just want to remind everybody to um, uh, please Twitter and um, put on Facebook because people do follow this and um, would be able to know about the webcast. So it's hashtag ICULib um, if you would like to tweet. And then we have some questions from our audience. The first one is, is there evidence-based studies comparing the COI with the RAS? Do, did you all look at any studies that compared those two? Actually, we have not seen any studies comparing the two, and um, we just decided to use the RAS because we felt that it's um, easier for the nurses to follow since it really does not require patient input. We can observe their behavior and score it using the RAS and um, be able to gauge their agitation and restlessness by using it. Okay. And so there is a follow-up question um, much like that. Was just the RAS scale used to determine symptom-triggered medication dosing? Or this person asked, was the MINDS scale used? Um, and if the MIND scale was used, what was that specific? Why was that specific protocol chosen? So did you use something to trigger your um, medication dosing? No, actually, we, we did not. We we just the nurses just utilized the RAS scale, and then based on the RAS score, we would give it to the physicians, and the physicians, you know, generally were in the the room with us and could see how agitated the patients were, but it gave us something to uh, to be more objective with instead of you know the patient is you know crazy and climbing out of bed. We were able to say now you know my patient is plus four on the RAS scale, and how can we start treating it? Um, then they would decide on the dosage, and we would advance as we saw that it, it wasn't working. Then we would go from short acting to longer acting, to IV, from IV push medications to IV medications, and then start some long acting PO medications. So we didn't use any other scale than the RAS scale. Okay. And so were all of the patients who were admitted um, into your study, were they admitted with a primary diagnosis of alcohol withdrawal? or intoxication, or were some of them admitted with another primary diagnosis like sepsis or pneumonia, and then subsequently developed withdrawal? Actually, majority of our patients did not come with an admission of substance abuse or alcohol withdrawal. They are admitted with other diagnoses such as GI bleeds or pneumonia. And then, um, like we have said, we start uh, seeing symptoms that they are getting agitated, and so we start doing the RAS scoring every hour. And then, as we, as the day progresses, we now find out that they have um, alcohol uh, use, and so that's how we start treating them. Okay. Do you um, have an open or a closed unit? And um, I guess based on the answer to that. Um, how did you manage to convince the physician to go along and follow the protocol? Well, I, we do have an we have an open unit. It's um, you know it's not a closed unit specifically, um, but we do uh, we did involve the physicians early on with our ideas, um, and we we did speak to them about it and always kept them involved. Um, not only the intensivists in our unit, as well as because uh, we're a teaching hospital, all of the fellows were always involved. We asked for their input at all times. Um, actually, uh, one of the fellows was assigned to help us with any problems or any questions that we had regarding medications. But we basically spoke with our medical director, and he guided us with the types of medications that he wanted used. Um, and we, you know, added our nursing specialty to it with different nursing measures that we had seen that worked well for withdrawing patients. And you know, we learned a lot as we went along. We found that you know, IV Presidex did not work as well on on polysubstance abuse patients as it did more on alcohol abuse patients. And we just kind of, you know, worked through it as we went. That's why we kept a log of what medications or what measures worked best on each patient as we went through. 
um, just to see if there was any commonality between the medications and the types of patients that were being admitted. To add to that okay. also, we do have our regular daily rounds. Actually, we do rounds in the morning and in the nighttime. And so when we discuss the patients with our attending physicians and our fellows, we would talk to them on whether it patients' agitation are getting controlled or what needs to be changed, what needs to be added. And that's how we take care of our patients, by evaluating them frequently and making necessary changes. OK. Can you tell us a little bit about just nursing measures that you did um, that may have helped to calm the patient down? Actually, I think Lori has a, a story to tell you about the patient that she's had. So we actually, okay. I had, a, a, we, you know, being in Brooklyn, we have, it's multicultural here um, in, at Maimonides Medical Center. And really, we had, I had a patient that was extremely agitated. We did know going in that he had a diagnosis of pneumonia, but he also had a, a, a alcohol problem. And um, I was really struggling with him. And he was, he was very alert. And I just, I, you know, you get that nursing sense that this is not a patient that really needs to be well sedated. There was something that he was trying to tell me. And of course, there was a language barrier. We have the language line, but we're very fortunate here at Maimonides to have many patient reps and availability to us with many languages. So I finally was able to get someone to come up and speak to him in his language. And we found out that really his agitation was basically due to the fact that he needed to use the bathroom and unfortunately in that room we did not have a bathroom for him so I was able to work something out for him and and get him his, his cell phone and those two things you know changed the entire day for me because we were able to calm him down he felt safe he felt more comfortable and then I was able to you know actually have time to see my other patient and take care of my other patient in the ICU so that's why we wanted to stress that it's not just about medications and and how to you know sedate them it's about really looking into do they have pain you know can we toilet them more frequently um, can we get them early out of bed and you know a lot of times we've taken these patients out of bed and put them in the hallway right next to the nurse and just that they see somebody and they have you know can have con constant you know uh, communication with someone can really change your entire you know day so um, we have seen that the nursing measures as well as the medications in conjunction you know work really well for these patients thank you um, can you explain how you screened patients to determine if they were in alcohol withdrawal? So what was the process for screening them? Well, I think we base it on the history that we uh, eventually get from family members or from reviewing their charts. And then uh, symptoms that they exhibit, uh, that they are in delirium tremens, so tachycardia, um, the symptoms that we, uh, Lori had mentioned earlier, insomnia, anxiety, um, restlessness, um, their alcohol breath, and what else, Lori? We also do labs on them, so we oh, do yeah. an alcohol level, a tox screen on these patients when they come in, um, and, and we do start to see them exhibiting some signs and symptoms of withdrawal. Um, you know, we do a tox screen on these patients. Um, and, and like I said, most of the patients that come to us from the ED generally come intubated. So it's really hard if they don't have a family member with them, which most of them don't, to ascertain a good history. Um, but of course, always, you know, as soon as we can get them extubated, we try to find out what their alcohol use is or what, what their drug use is and when was the last time they used. So if we're within that 72-hour window, we can start to address um, symptoms early, you know, early on. Okay, thank you. Do you have any kind of tool within your facility um, to that you screen patients outside of the ICU for alcohol withdrawal? So we don't actually, um, and that is part of this project and what we hope to do with it. Um, because the RAS score and using the RAS scale in the ICU was convenient for the nurses and it and seemed to work for us, we would, we're trying to roll now this project out to the other intensive care units as well as the emergency department. Um, and when we move from there, we do have uh, a behavioral unit that we would like to move this, um, this whole project out to and then start using it on the medical floors because ultimately a lot of these patients 
do get transferred from the ICU much earlier now with this program in place. And, um, you know, they do move out to medical floors. And so, you know, we generally don't move any of the patients out of the ICU until they're completely done with drawing. But sometimes patients are admitted to the floor before they come to the ICU because we don't know that they are going to have symptoms of withdrawal and they start withdrawing on the floor. So we would really like to roll this whole project out to the entire medical center. Okay, thank you. Um, can you explain why dexmetomidine was selected as the primary infusion instead of a lorazepam infusion? We generally just don't use uh, IV infusion of the lorazepam as per our uh, doctor's preference, I would say. Okay. Um, and you know, um, someone had suggested to use the, the Presidex, and that's why um, we have started using that. And we, we also okay. found that with, with a Presidex strip that we were able to, the patients w were not totally snowed. They weren't so sedated that we weren't able to give them their medications. We could still feed the patients. Um, they were easily arousable on the drip and yet calm. Um, but that is one of the medications that uh, our pharmacy came to us with some budgetary restraints and actually preferred us not to use. So we really, um, we started out the project by using um, Presidex strips more often and toward the end of the project we're not using them at all because of the cost of the medication. And so when you stopped using the dexmetomidine, how did you manage the patient? I think that we just increased the doses of Ativan. Uh, we increased the frequency that we gave it. Um, and then we started long-acting medications, PO medications, um, a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, we still would use it if it was best practice for the patient, um, but we tried to avoid it because of the cost of the medication. OK. Um, and then um, one of the callers said that they thought you mentioned that you did not use sitters, and they want to know, how do you prevent over-medication? Because often she finds nurses become frustrated and busy and um, tend to maybe um, over-medicate the patient. So like we said, we have our uh, frequent monitoring through the RAS. And we are using different nursing measures just to help the patients. And so as Lori had mentioned earlier, we sometimes would even get them out of bed and let them sit with us along the hallway and just really um, keep an eye on them and try to see what they need. And all of us in our um, unit help each other so that when someone else is doing something, then we ask the other staff to help us out and sit with the patient. And with our uh, patient care tech, we, after they are done with all the responsibilities, we also ask them to help us out and sit with the patient. And that is how we do it. Whereas before, we had a designated one-to-one -one companion to sit with them. But due to um, budgetary constraints in the hospital, they, we have stopped using that. And by helping each other in the unit, that's how we are able to manage these patients. And also, uh, as a, as a fail-safe on our algorithm, if our RAS score, and again, we're doing it hourly, um, is greater than negative three sustained for four hours, we start titrating down those medications to avoid over-sedation in these patients. OK. And so um, a question came in about, were, all of, were the patients who were counted in your study, were they all intubated, or were some of them non-intubated? No, not all of them are intubated. Um, I would say, like I said, out of the 71 patients that we have identified prior to the launch of the project, uh, there were 48 who were intubated. And then during the project implementation, out of the 54 patients, there were 24 patients that were intubated. Thank you. So we have a, a, a very nice comment. It says, thank you for a terrific presentation. Um, and they went on to say they're working on a nurse-managed um, alcohol withdrawal protocol and are wondering if you would share your algorithm. Would you be able to do that? And could you talk through the specifics of what medications were ordered um, and provider preference and what doses, range doses based on RAS, that's a lot, <laughs> or just PRN doses? 
So I guess the, the, the crux of the question is, could you go into a little bit more specifics about um, how medications were ordered, um, what kind of doses you used, um, did you have range doses, those sorts of things? Okay, so for our, our medications, to start with the uh, Presidex infusion, you, we use it by uh, base, uh, weight base. So it starts from 0.2 to 0.7 mics per kg. And then the Ativan dose, we start low, um, we start at 2 milligrams IV push, and we either increase the dose or we increase the frequency either um, every, even as frequently as 30 minutes. Um, or every two hours or every four hours, so depending on the need of the patient. And then as for uh, Delibrium, we um, start the dose anywhere from 25 milligrams to like 100 milligrams every six hours. And then on rounds, we decide whether we can decrease the dosage or decrease the frequency from every six down to every eight hours, every 12, or daily, and then eventually just discontinue the medication. Um, and go ahead. Well, like for morphine, um, uh, for pain, we start at like five milligrams IV push. It it really depends on the doctor, and it it's it also depends on the patient's condition, based on their weight and based on their agitation. Because some of them um, are not. Um, it takes a while, it takes a longer time, or it takes a, a much bigger dose to control the agitation regardless of their weight or their condition. So it, it, it's probably because of um, the abu uh, you know, how much alcohol they have taken prior. OK. And so um, did you always have to approach the physician for the dose, or did you have some sort of algorithm or protocol that you followed and the nurse could do a PRN um, based on her assessment? No, we did not. It was always an approach to the physicians um, because, um, you know, of course, the physicians are the one who order the medications um, for us. Um, I mean, we always there was always input. Um, it's a, a very autonomous uh, ICU, so the nurses would be, you know, very um, they really promoted the program, but the physicians were always ultimately, you know, the ones who decided the doses and the frequency for the patients. I mean, certainly. We would be keeping them updated with, you know, RAS scores uh, even, you know, more frequently than hourly. Um, and, and, and generally, the physicians are very hands-on. They're in the room with the nurse most of the time. And, uh, and they're, you know, they're there to lend a hand and, you know, we can, you know, go up as needed or go down as needed. Having the algorithm okay. also helps the nurses to suggest to the doctor that you know if one of the medications is not yet started, then maybe we could add it if we're not able to manage the agitation with what is presently ordered. So that's how um, the algorithm has helped the nurses in um, talking to the doctors and figuring out what medications to give to the patient. Okay, but, thank you. But uh, absolutely, yeah. the doctor needs to order the medications. We cannot give anything without their order. Okay. So we had a comment from um, a participant. Um, they love the idea of using the RAS, and they are also currently um, developing a protocol using the RAS. And UC Davis has actually used the RAS as an alcohol withdrawal on the alcohol withdrawal protocol and has actually published on this protocol. So there is some evidence out there um, that the RAS uh, can be used in this way. Can you provide additional details about how the protocol guided the nurses to give various medications, um, antipsychotic versus benzos versus opioids? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, if you look at, at the, you know, if we had the scale in front of us, the algorithm in front of us, definitely, um, <clears throat> um, you know, most of the opioids would be used for pain management. Um, we really stayed with benzos um, to treat uh, the, our alcohol withdrawing patients. Um, and, uh, 
you know, we found that gabapentin was added um, further on down the line um, because the, the uh, you know, there was evidence-based practice that gabapentin worked um, in polysubstance abuse patients. So you know, basically, there was a sharing of literature, um, you know, from our intensivists with the nursing staff um, ongoing so that we could keep modifying uh, the algorithm um, to keep up Was there a population or diagnosis that accompanied the withdrawal that made the program more challenging, such as a concomitant neuro or trauma event? Well, we're a medical ICU, so we basically don't see many uh, trauma patients here. Um, most patients come in with medical diagnosis like an ammonia or a GI bleed, which always does make the situation more difficult, um, especially if these patients come in hypotensive, they're septic, um, and then, you know, we're giving uh, medications that may drop their blood pressure further. Um, so that's always a challenge. Um, but uh, basically, um, we, you know, most of the patients that came in um, were patients with medical diagnoses. So uh, when we were able to treat their, their withdrawing, um, but I, I think basically what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we found that patients in, with polysubstance abuse withdrawal, um, drug abuse withdrawal as opposed to alcoholics were harder to manage for the nurses um, once we were able to figure out what they were withdrawing from. Um, because, you know, a lot of the medications seem to work better, the benzos work better for alcoholics. Um, and so it was, it was, you know, very, you know, there was such a range for um, drug abuse patients uh, more than alcoholic patients. So um, I think those were more difficult. I don't know, Christina, do you agree? Yeah. And so um, I know, Christina, you said earlier that you didn't use a lot of continuous infusion sedatives as part of this algorithm. Did you ever use them, and what kinds of patients did you use them on? I We never used the IV uh, antivent infusion, if that is the question. Um, it's And okay. like I had mentioned earlier, it's for the doctor's preference. Okay. So did you offer your patients any addiction or recovery skills while they were um, in the hospital? We refer them to our social worker, and they are the ones that work with them. And also we refer them to psych, um, you know, for evaluation, as well as um, to introduce them to rehab programs. And then um, what did you use as a basis to differentiate withdrawal um, from substance versus alcohol? Really, basically, it would come down to what we see. What we would see was working better on the patients, and then once these patients, if if they were intubated, they were extubated, we could have a conversation with them. A lot of times, we would find out, um, you know, what they were actually withdrawing from, when their last drink was, or when their last drug use was. Um, Unfortunately, we have a couple of, as they call it, frequent flyers that come into the ICU. So we knew their drug of choice before they came in. Um, so it was a little easier to uh, map out an algorithm for those patients. But basically, it just would come from, you know, good history and physical skills. Um, and, and, you know, if they did have a family member come in, we could ascertain information from them as well. Okay. And... Um, would you say that your program was a detox program versus just a management of withdrawal symptoms? No, I, I would definitely say it was just managing withdrawal symptoms. We didn't really detox people completely here. I think that's really something for a you know a rehab, and we do not have any detox in this facility. So, um, and the patients, you know, they. They stayed with us, but they didn't stay with us really, you know, for like a two-week period or anything. Um, so they were with us just so we could get them over the hump of their withdrawal as well as 
dealing with their medical issues that brought them to the intensive care unit. So definitely, I would say a management of withdrawal symptoms, definitely not a detox. Okay. And then on those patients that you did use um, dexamethamine with, yes. did you ever um, go over the maximum dosage recommended by the manufacturer? Yes, we have. Um, and actually, I remember that those are typically for patients who are uh, overweight. So they require much more than the 0.7, which is the maximum dose that the manufacturer requires. Um, so we do increase the dose as per the doctor's approval and as per patient's tolerance. Okay. And so for those patients, and we've already had one question like this, but for those patients who have been identified by the med search staff as having withdrawal, do all of those patients get transferred back to the ICU right away? Uh, it depends on the the doc the doctors would have to evaluate the patient first, and they will decide whether the patient needs to come back to us or the patient needs to be transferred to us from the medical floor. Okay. And we have a question about um, we have, this pet particular hospital has lots of problems with people with marijuana withdrawal. Um, do you have that same issue there? And if so, is the treatment the same? We actually have just started seeing uh, several patients in our ICU over the last couple of weeks uh, with synthetic marijuana withdrawal um, and uh, recently had an influx of patients with a molly withdrawal with really bad side effects. So um, these are new things. Uh, we do still institute uh, our, our algorithm for these patients, but I think we're going to need more um, of these patients to come in to see what really works best for them. And, and um, you know, I, a lot of times, I mean, the patients that we've had uh, that I just described, um, none of them were intubated. So we really were able to work with them a little bit better with our nursing measures. We were able to communicate with them better. Uh, we knew early on what their drugs were. They came in really specifically because they were withdrawing um, and not with comorbidities. So I think time will tell if, if there are new changes that we need to make to our algorithm. And that's what's so good about this is because it's ever-changing based on, you know, evidence-based practice. So. <clears throat> okay, and we have a question from, um, I would assume it's a community hospital um, that does not have attendings and fellows, so they do not have people in their unit all the time. Um, and their question is, um, can you give them some advice about how to build a nurse-driven protocol so that um, they could be able to implement some of the things that you've talked about today when they don't have a physician there to give them an order? Well, actually, if you follow the algorithm, we have identified a lot of nursing measures that um, had really helped us a lot in managing these patients. And then the use of the RAS, I think, can substantiate, you know, if they call the doctors and um, report on how severe the agitation is and whether it's not improving at all or, you know, by scoring it, whether it's coming down or it's still uh, consistently at a plus three or plus four. Um, in terms of medications, I believe that the doctor still needs to approve um, the, you know, the medications that could be given to the patient. So I know okay. I, I've worked in the past in um, other hospitals, and some of them did not was not were not teaching hospitals. They do not have physicians um, constantly in the ICU, and I know that there usually is a hospitalist. And uh, once you have buy-in from that physician, um, and I think that you know the physician, you know, they'd be able to go through the algorithm with him and be using the RAS score as, as the tool to be objective about their agitation, um, then he could really base his doses on, on their RAS scale um, and their communication. So, um, but I definitely think you would need a, a physician to order the medications um, because, you know, that's not what nurses do. So, um, but we have all the other parts to um, the algorithm that we could implement in the meantime until the hospitalist was able to get to their ICU. Okay. And um, 
do you when you um, you mentioned that you wanted to um, be able to roll this out to some of your med search floors so that all those patients would not have to come back? Would you envision that the RAS would be used um, after these patients are transferred to the floor to continue to manage them? We certainly would hope so because um, over here in MICU that had really helped us a lot, and it's. Um, you know, easy for the nurses to gauge it. So um, the validity, I think, is um, is good. You know, when you score it as a plus three versus a plus one, you could see the the difference right away. So it's not confusing for the nurses to use. Okay. And um, we have a question about: Can you comment on your restraint usage? Um, up, down, um, the same. So we have not used restraints in the intensive care unit for many years. I've been here 25 plus years. Um, restraint use is not really an option for us. So uh, chemical restraint is, is the only way that we go here in the intensive care unit. So I can definitely say it continues to be down um, because we don't use them at all. We do use mittens. Um, they're not tied mittens. Um, but we do not use any tied restraints in the ICU. Okay. Um, uh, do you have an admission criteria for severe alcohol withdrawal to the ICU? In other words, um, would, would it also have been based on the RAS, like um, a RAS of greater than plus two? So we don't have a specific uh, criteria because it's the fellows and the attendings that accept the patients to the intensive care unit. But any withdrawing patient um, is accepted at this point to the medical ICU because if they're actively withdrawing, they need to be in a monitored setting. So um, any patient that is in active withdrawal would be admitted to the intensive care unit uh, automatically. Okay. Um, what medications do you use for seizures? For seizures, we usually um, treat them with dilantin, Keppra. Caproic acid, uh, okay. phenobarb. Um, depends on whether the patient had seizures prior to this or um, was just seizing now uh, related to the withdrawal. OK. Was there a role for Haldol in your protocol? Um, we rarely use it. Uh, we do give the ketamine, and so far it's not um, a, a common practice for us to use the Haldol. Okay. And um, well, um, did you use any barbiturates in your protocol? And I'm assuming to treat seizures. No, we have not done it. The doctors have talked about it on their uh, rounds, but we have not used it for um, patients in withdrawal at this point. OK. Once the alcohol withdrawal is complete, do you ever see withdrawal from the benzos that you've given the patient? No, we have we have not seen that because, again, we're, we're utilizing the RAS scale so frequently that if if there is a, a negative three on the RAS scale for greater than four hours, we're titrating our benzos down as uh, as well as our long acting meds. So um, you know we even will titrate Librium, uh, you know, within a 12 hour period, um, you know, definitely titrate it down if we found find the patient is too drowsy, um, and we'll titrate our benzos the same way. So we really have not had any episodes of benzo withdrawal uh, in and the I ICU. Think, and I think that's why the doctors here prefer to use the um, IV push at event compared to the IV infusion, because then um, it's not consistently given to the patient. And so if the patient doesn't need it, then he doesn't get a dose for that particular hour. Okay. Hence, avoiding um, you know, withdrawal, possibility of withdrawal from the medication. OK. So we are almost uh, a minute before the hour. So I would like to thank Christina and Laurie from, from the Monides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, for presenting their mm -hmm. um, um, presentation today, a nurse-driven protocol for the management of alcohol and polysubstance abuse in conjunction with the, um, the 
AACN's Clinical Scene Investigator Academy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for having us at SCCM. Thank you very much.